Welcome to episode three of our virtual foraging. Now we are in national lockdown, part three. Um, sadly, we were going to be doing lots and lots of uh, walks and adventures with you this month. And here we are, locked down in our front rooms again. But we are still here with funding to bring the wild to you. And today we are in the most fantastic place that we have, I feel, in our local community. And that is our graveyard. Now, here we are in Milbrook Graveyard in the closed section. Um, this is currently being being managed as a conservation area and it's one of the best places in the community to come and find wild food. Why? It's not sprayed with any chemicals, uh, dogs are rarely off the lead and we've got such a rare beautiful botanical array of edible plants here because this is actually an ancient meadow. So before everyone was buried here, this was a meadow. And so we have all of those wonderful plants popping up that haven't been altered for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So today we are going to be taking inspiration from Northern Italy. We are going to be making some hand cut, handmade pasta. And we're going to show you how to make a really beautiful wild winter salad. So we've got five lovely wild edibles and then a cookery demonstration here in the beautiful January sun. Okay, this may be episode three of our wild food journey, but in a way this could well be episode one. We are in January, the very start of our wild food calendar. And if you really want to get into wild food and foraging, this is a fantastic month to start. We've had a really indulgent Christmas and New Year, filling our bodies with rich foods and alcohol. And in a way the hedgerow and the, and the landscape is now showing us how to detox our bodies and how to get nutrients and vital elements back into our system. And so the very first wild edible that I want to talk to you about today is my best friend, the stinging nettle, or urtica, if you like to know the Latin names of plants. Now, traditionally, if you have a wild food book or you watch wild food videos, you'll notice that nettles are something that's spoken about in the spring. We have something called climate change in our world, and so don't just rely on what books tell you, uh, what foods are growing month to month. Come out and have a look at what's happening in the hedgerow yourself, and you'll see that this January, if you live here in Cornwall, that the nettles right now are looking at their best. We've got this really young growth happening all over banks. Now, nettles are something that a lot of people are afraid of. When we're children we fall into things of nettles and we get stung and so we have this fear of them for all our lives. If you have a cat at home um, and you want to stroke your cat and give it some uh, affection, the way that you would approach it is not to go from its tail to its head and stroke all its fur up backwards. Now stinging nettles are a little bit like cats, believe it or not. If you imagine that the top of the stinging nettle is a cat's head and the bottom is a cat's tail and you stroke a nettle down its fur, it won't sting you. These little hairs here will sting you if you touch them in any other way. Now those little hairs, if you look at them under a microscope, are like a tiny little sword. And inside that sword are something called neurotransmitters, of which there are seven. And one of those neurotransmitters is called serotonin. And serotonin is what makes us really happy. Now we are in another lockdown and some of you will be feeling sad and some of you will be feeling depressed that you've lost your work and all these things are going on. I promise you, if you come outside and you pick nettles and you start to eat these and get them into your diet, you will start to feel happier. You do not need to sting yourself to get that serotonin in your diet. You just need to eat them. Now we are going to be making an amazing recipe with these today. Nettles are not just a frugal food, a survivalism food. We can make some gourmet dishes with this ingredient. We are going to be making homemade stinging nettle pasta, which is based on a North Italian recipe. But there is absolutely tons you could do with them. Don't buy nettle tea bags if you live in Britain. It's absolutely pointless. Pick some nettles, put them in a cup, put on some hot water, et voila, nettle tea. Um, we can make nettle soup. You can, make, you, can, you can put them into mashed potato with cheese. You can put them into pasties, into curries, into lasagnas, into casseroles. There is so much you can do. You can make beer. Nettle beer is an amazing thing. Perhaps we'll do a video all about that one day. So what are these good for? They are absolutely rammed full of iron. They are rammed full of vitamin C. Serotonin, as I said, they're just a superfood and actually another one that I feel should be the national food of Britain. We are living in times of food poverty and yet we have these growing on every corner in the UK. How to pick them without getting stung? Well, you might have noticed that I pick them using my fingers. That is because I'm used to picking them. If you're not used to picking them, get yourself a pair of scissors, take your basket, put it underneath the nettle itself and just snip and in they go. 
Then all you need to do to not get stung at home is to pour those nettles into boiling water and let them steep for about 20 minutes. After about 20 minutes, you can take them out and manipulate them by hand and the sting is completely gone. So nettles, superfood and number one on our list. They grow absolutely everywhere. Take them out with your children, go out with your family, take your baskets. You cannot misidentify them for anything that is poisonous. Honestly, this is a superfood that is going to make you feel happy and great during this lockdown. Number two on our list is the basis of every single dish that I cook. And actually, at this time of year, something that nobody should really be buying from a supermarket or a shop. If you look all across this site, you will see these long, waving, what look like grass, until you come down closely and you have a better look. Now, these are all wild chives, wild allium, a wild onion. Every single dish that you find in a recipe book will normally have an onion as its base. So this is absolutely fantastic that at this time of year we can come out and get enough onions to pretty much last us for the year. Now, it's January, so the ground is very hard and there's been a frost. So when you try to pull these up, you're going to struggle, like I just have, to get a bulb out of the ground. But on the end of these, when the ground has warmed up a little bit and you pull them out, there will be a bulb much like a spring onion. Now you can chop these up and add them to a dish. Um, you could put them into your oil as you're stir frying or frying um, in a pan. Um, but they really are a beautiful thing just to have in the salad bowl as well, fresh. So these are wild chives. Now alliums you cannot really confuse because when you smell, they smell really, really strongly of onion or garlic, much like in one of our previous episodes when we were looking at the three-cornered garlic or three-cornered leek. So they are our wild chives. Number three on the list is something that always really surprises people when I say that you can eat them. They're a really iconic plant that represents springtime, although here we are in January with them all in bloom. And excitingly for me anyway, we've had a frost overnight and if you pick one of the leaves very gently out of the grass and you just crack, you'll see the little ice crystals cracking on top of the leaf, which is just delightful if you like tactile things like me. Anyway, primroses. We are living in the countryside here. And something that I've always really loved is the knowledge that before these were um, quite rare to see growing, um, countryside people would come and pick primroses all the time and make wines and vinegars and pickles with them. The plant is edible. The leaves are a really abundant salad leaf. The very baby primrose leaves are quite mild, like a mild, kind of like a mild spinach almost. The larger ones um, are more bitter in flavour, but they're really good for cooking with, um, <clears throat> for example, if you've got a pan, without any oil and you're just making it hot, you can slightly brown the leaves on one side, a little bit of sea salt, and they're a really lovely crispy leaf to have on the side of a dish. But the small baby primrose leaves are an absolutely delectable leaf to have in the salad bowl, and you can pick lots quite quickly. Um, we're gonna have these on the side of our dish today. But what makes dishes really, really stunning at this time of year are the fact that lots of things are coming into flower. And edible flowers really excite me because it makes any dish beautiful. Now I'm gonna pick some of these little primrose flowers here. Um, the Victorians used to love to crystallise them. All you do is you heat a little bit of sugar and water in a pan until you're getting a sort of syrupy glaze. And then you can put the primroses delicately in that and then leave them on the side to set. And you can use those for cake work um, or in jellies and things like that. But I like to put them just fresh as they are into the salad bowl. They've got a very mild, almost buttery light taste. And um, it's quite unusual. A slightly darker yellow in the middle and you've got these beautiful five petaled heart shaped um, on the outsides here, this lighter yellow colour. Not only the yellow primroses are edible, also when you see the purple ones or the dark pink ones, you can use those too. And that's really nice and exciting as you get a monopoly of colours then in your salad bowl. So there you go, primroses, beautiful January wild edible. Number four brings us to this beautiful, wild, edible supermarket lane of free wild ingredients. Isn't it wonderful that just here we've got plants we've already been speaking about. We've got our primrose, we've got our young baby nettles. From earlier episodes, we've got our beautiful young common sorrel, if you remember those plants with the little fork down the bottom of the stem. 
But also what we've got here are two members of the gallium family. Now there are lots of edible galliums and two of them here are my favourites. One of them is really recognisable to most of you. Now when we're children we might know these as a plant called sticky weed or sticky willy. Other names are goosegrass or cleavers and these are the plants that come foraging for you rather than you go foraging for it. Now this plant has got one of the fav my favourite words in the whole of the English language to say when we talk about how to identify them and in recognising the shape. Now the stem of galliums are completely square, so if you run your thumb and your finger around that stem, it's got a completely square shape. And then when you look at how the leaves are growing, they're growing in what we call whorls, W-H-O-R-L-S, whorl. And those whorls go all the way up the stem. Now this is true of all members of this family of plant. So this one, the goosegrass, the sticky willy, the cleavers, are the ones that stick to you because of the little hairs that they have growing all over them. Now you can eat these, you can eat cleavers uh, but because of their um, little hairs that stick to you they've got a, a mildly irritating texture and so with these really you make a, a fresh tea or you could put them into soups and stews um, and they're a very good um, detox they help to clean out the liver and the kidneys and they're very very um, high in nutrients they're very very good for you they taste a little bit like um, the casing of peas or like monge too another member of this family is called hedge bed straw. Now it's growing right next to it, which is why we came down here to film. And as you can see, it's got exactly the same structure. There's its square stem, and here are its leaves going around in whirls up the stem. But unlike the cleavers, the goosegrass that sticks to you, this one is completely hairless and smooth, so it won't stick to you. And because it's hairless and smooth, it's a much nicer edible texture. Um, so it's better to eat in the salad bowl, much nicer to eat raw and it has just that fresh vibrant beautiful burst of pea flavor in your mouth pea flavor like the garden pea not like urine obviously that wouldn't be very nice <laughs> um, so come down with your scissors and pick the young tops of this plant now we're going to put a few in our salad bowl but you can also make a really vibrant bright green soup with this and um, get your and um, your chives put them in some butter in a pan make a little bit of flour make a roux pour on some stock or some hot water and then add lots and lots of these green hedge bed straw tops and you get this lovely bright green soup which is really great and nourishing and a beautiful thing to eat after all the heavy foods of christmas so the reason why it's called hedge bed straw is because back in the days of poverty people used to stuff potato sacks with it and use it as pillows because it's actually a very soft supple plant so there you go so that is our gallium and that is hedge bed straw the final wild edible that we're going to talk about today is probably the plant that I would say if you're going to remember any one plant that I ever talk about let it be this one um, it's a plant that I find it essential to teach your children it's normally the first plant that we pick up on the start of any foraging walk that we do and something that I insist you always have in your pocket before we begin. And that is the very humble little wild edible plant called ribwort plantain. Now when I was a kid we used to call this Chinese chewing gum. Don't ask me why, we used to put it in our mouth and chew it up and pretend we had chewing gum. Spelt the same way as those big yellow banana looking things, plantain, but a completely different plant. It is called ribwort plantain because it's got a spear-like leaf and when you turn it round it's got these skinny looking like ribs at the back of the plant. Now they can almost be used in the larger plants a bit like dental floss. They're very stringy and when you pull them out look it's like a little piece of string in the middle of the leaf. Okay that is the rib in the plant, ribwort plantain. Now this plant is the cure-all for so many things. Not only is it an edible, but it's a fantastic, miraculous medicinal. This will take away a nettle sting in about 30 seconds. So a really good one when we're picking our nettles to make our pasta. We want to also be picking up some plantain just in case we accidentally touch the nettle in the wrong way and get a little jab of serotonin into our system. So if we get stung, what do we do? Well, simply find the plantain, pick a number of leaves. Now I like to get about six or seven leaves of a fairly decent size in my hand. Scrumple them up into a ball get a tight little scrumple going on and then using the heel of your hands the hardest part of your hand you want to rub 
Now, if you've ever been on a foraging walk with me, you would have seen me do this hundreds of times. But you keep rubbing and you keep rubbing and you keep rubbing. And what will happen is you will get this really, really bright, vibrant green juice. Now, that green juice will take a sting away like I said, in about 30 seconds. This also works for bee stings, horse fly bites, sunburn. This is also a cure for acne, eczema, psoriasis, dermatitis. Um, this is, it's just, uh, my friend got a bite by a dog, a really nasty bite by a dog. I made her a plantain balm, took that away. Uh, cold sores, spots, it's just an absolutely miraculous thing. The Romans used to pick this and put it between the soles of their feet um, and their sandals. And when they were marching, it would act as a poultice to help cure sore feet. So it really is an amazing medicinal plant. But it's not just medicinal, it's not just for healing um, skin conditions and skin problems. Also makes you look like the Incredible Hulk, which is quite fun. Um, it's a nice edible. Now, not when it's large, when the leaves get larger, you put them on a baking tray, a light spray of oil, a bit of sea salt, and then some Chinese five spice or smoked paprika, and you put them in the oven at a low heat um, for about 10 minutes, and you get crisps, really lovely, delectable crisps. When they're young and they're little, like this, in a salad bowl, just in the salad bowl, a salad dressing of your choice. Today we're going to be dressing our salad with a mustard and honey dressing. You could use a balsamic glaze, you could use a Caesar salad dressing, whatever you like. Um, if you like the taste of fresh green flavours, just have them in the salad bowl on their own. So this is rib wort plantain. So here we are at the cookery section of the show today and we are moving into an area of northern Italy where they make their own pasta. Now the reason why I've chosen this recipe is because as you may now be aware we are doing wild food boxes for people in our community who are on a low or no income and I think it's really important to show people how you can make a really tasty nutritious dish dish for absolutely next to nothing. So making your own pasta requires some flour and some patience. Um, it's a really good thing to do with your children. It's a lovely recipe to do in lockdown. So all you have to do is buy some flour and get the wild ingredients that you had today. And we're gonna show you how to make a really beautiful, tasty, amazing dish. So, zero, zero flour. Now, if you don't have zero, zero flour or you don't have a shop that sells it by you, you can use any flour that you have in your cupboard. However, this makes a much nicer pasta. So this I bought in Widdicombe's, our little local shop in Millbrook. It's also very good for making pizzas. So if you have this in the cupboard, you can use it for more than one recipe. Flour. The other thing you're going to need is the first ingredient that we picked today in the wild and that is our wonderful beautiful nettles. Now when you get home, you've been out, you've got your basket full of nettles, you're going to need some boiling hot water. So I have, because we are outside in the wild, a flask of boiling hot water. Put that into a saucepan. Now it needs to be boiling hot because what you want to do is make sure you're crushing and destroying all of those little tiny hairs on the stinging nettle that can hurt you. Now if you're going to do this at home and you're not used to handling nettles, I suggest using a pair of scissors. So you could pick the nettles out of the basket with your scissors and just put those straight into the hot water. So there you are, nettles in the pan, give those a poke down so they're in the water. Put that on top. It's going to put that to one side for a minute and those nettles are going to steep in that boiling water. Now, we want to make some pasta dough. Once your nettles have been steeped in the water, you want to put those into a liquidizer and put it on a fast blend. Now here we are, I did this this morning, Blue Peter style in my kitchen. This bright green, lovely swirling liquid is our nettles blitzed in water. You are going to put that through a sieve. So, put that in here and you don't want to waste any of the nutrients in those nettles so using a spoon push that through as so and then the nettles have lost all their sting they're not going to hurt you you can now pick them up by your hand and just squeeze them out now in a bowl you want to put your flour now depending on how much pasta you want to make is how much you put in the bowl. I always go by eye. I am not one of these chefs that go by measurements. 
make a little hole in the middle of the flower and start to pour in your bright nettly water. Now you want to get what they describe as a shaggy, not shaggy the it wasn't me, but shaggy consistency of the flower in your bowl. So just mix it around with your hand and you're going to notice that the flower is a lovely green colour with this nettily water. That's what you're looking for. You want that vibrant, beautiful colour. So all the nutrients of the nettles are there in your pasta mix. Now, you'll see some pasta recipes that use egg. This recipe requires no eggs, and the reason why I've chosen that one is because it's even cheaper. So that needs just a little bit more. And this essentially what you have in here is a pure nettle tea, which is also really good for you. So when you're making your pasta, you can have a nice cup of nettle tea on the side. Nice messy in the kitchen. Now, ideally, you don't really want to knead this. You don't want to overwork it. If you overwork it and knead it too much, you're going to get a really rubbery, chewy pasta noodle. That's not what we're looking for. And you want to let the nettle flavour infuse into the dough. So I like to leave it overnight. But if you're in a rush and you want it there and then, you can get away with leaving it for about half an hour before cutting the noodles. But you don't want it to dry out. So what you do with some olive oil, you put some olive oil onto the dough. <sighs> Making sure your dough ball is now covered in the oil. And then using either a beeswax wrap, if you're going to be ethical and sustainable, or cling film, if that's what you've got in the house. Cover your dough and put that to one side, ideally for 24 hours overnight or half an hour. Now, Blue Peter Styley, here's one I made earlier. So this is my lovely nettle dough from yesterday. Take a piece of your dough Smooth that basket, put it onto the board. Look at that, beautiful. I don't know if you can really see in this light, but that is a gorgeous green, light green colour with little flecks of nettle running through the dough, which is absolutely beautiful. I'm just going to give that one more roll. Now, pizza roller. Cut your noodles into fine, long strips. And when you pull them off like this, you want to hang them. Now you could use a bowl with a rolling pin over the top. I have this basket here, so I'm just going to pop them like that over there. So here we have our lovely noodles now hanging over the top of our basket and you need to bring some water to the boil on the pan. So I've just put this water back on and it's good to add a little bit of salt to that water as well. Now whilst that's coming up to boil, we have our salad put together here that we picked earlier. So you find yourself a nice plate and then assemble that. So we've got our baby primrose leaves, our lovely um, baby ribwet plantain, our chives all chopped up and we've got our delicate hedge bed straw with its lovely whirls running up the stem and our primrose flowers. So that's all there as a lovely salad and we just want to make a little dressing for that. Now I said earlier in the film that I like a honey and mustard which is what I've got here so a scoop of our Cornish honey. This one is a, a Widdicombe's honey from local hives in the area. Put a spoon of that in there and I've got some whole grain mustard, dollop of that, some olive oil and then a little splash of vinegar. This is balsamic vinegar, you could use cider vinegar, white wine vinegar. If you haven't got any vinegar, if you've got a jar of pickled onions in the cupboard or pickled gherkins, you could put a splash of the vinegar from that in. So give that a mix around. is not going to take as long to cook as dry pasta that you buy in the shop. So it literally takes about four minutes. So water boiling, pasta comes off and in. Now it's going to sink, it will very quickly then float to the top of the pan and when it starts to float you want to give it 
between two to four minutes. After two minutes, take a piece out and check. Whoop, get in there. Whoop. Take those off there. Put my lid back on. Noodles are done. Using a slotted spoon, carefully take them out of the boiling water. Okay, now I am going to dress this very, very simply with some parmesan, oh, first of all, some walnut oil. Now you could use olive oil, but I got this walnut oil for Christmas, which is really, really lovely. So I'm going to put a slight dribble of the walnut oil on top. And then I'm going to put some parmesan cheese. Now you could use cheddar, you could use vegan cheese, you could put no cheese, but I am a big fan of parmesan. So I'm going to grate that on the top like that. I am going to put a little tiny zest of lemon rind, just like that for some colour as well as some zest. I'm going to put a handful of my lovely wild salad on the side here. Get the bed straw in there. Make it look pretty. I'm going to drizzle on some of my salad dressing on there. And voila, there you have it. Homemade nettle pasta with a winter wild salad cooked outside. What could be more scrummy than that? So I'm going to get, in fact, I am the chef, so I'm just going to go straight in. Ha! Bellissimo.